Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Pauline Wu, and I'm a geriatric psychiatrist uh, at UCLA. I'm also the medical director of geriatric psychiatry at the Motion Picture Television Fund, and we're soon going to be opening an inpatient unit out in Woodland Hills. Today, we're doing a webinar about the three Ds, delirium, dementia, and depression. So thanks for joining us. And um, if you have any questions, please use Twitter and use the hashtag UCLAMDChat, and I'll be able to answer those questions after I'm done with the presentation. So here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we'll start with why are the three Ds important? Why are we even having this webinar today? And then we're actually going to go through each of uh, the three diagnoses independently, and then we'll summarize um, our discussion. So delirium, dementia, and depression are three distinct diagnoses, um, but obviously there are some significance, um, and it turns out to be that they are the three most prevalent diagnoses in geriatric psychiatry. They're easy to remember because they all start with the letter D, um, but the confusing part is that they do have overlapping symptoms. Um, and um, oftentimes these symptoms make it hard to diagnose, um, but that's why we're going to go through each one of them separately and uh, learn about the differences between each one. We're going to start off with delirium. So I'd like to define delirium first. It's a syndrome of acutely altered mental status characterized by inattention and, a fluctuating, and has a fluctuating course. Um, family members, uh, when they describe someone who's delirious, will often say, oh, you know, they're, they're out of it. They're not acting like themselves. Um, and one of the key findings is that there's an acute onset. So there's really a change um, that occurs within really, you know, minutes, hours to days. Um, and this, this will help differentiate delirium from some of the other things we'll be talking about today. Um, of the three diagnoses, delirium is the one that is considered a medical emergency. And um, it's, if untreated, the mortality rate can be between 10 to 25 percent. So it is a true medical emergency and it is important that it's uh, recognized and treated. The prevalence of delirium is actually low in the community setting, but in specific settings, the prevalence really dramatically rises. So in uh, 15 to 25 percent of hospital admissions are actually due to delirium. Um, and then as the acuity increases, for example, uh, postoperatively after surgery, um, especially in the ICU, the prevalence rate really rises and we're seeing rates, you know, of 50%, 70 to 80%, specifically in older populations. Um, afterwards, after leaving the hospital, you know, up to 60% of patients uh, that live in the nursing home over the age of 75 can have delirium at any time. Um, one of the biggest risk factors for delirium is having pre-existing dementia. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll help define that so, so we all know what dementia means. Um, so delirium is caused by many things, um, but they're all really medical things. Um, and one of the most common causes of delirium is infection. And that can be a urinary tract infection. Uh, pneumonia is also a common one. Um, but also there are other imbalances that can cause delirium, dehydration, uh, electrolyte imbalances. So if you, any of your salts, sugars are either too high, too low, uh, or any of your other electrolytes, that can also cause a delirium. If you ever sustain a fall or a head injury, that can be a cause. If there's a lack of oxygen to the brain, um, as well as it can also be a side effect to medication, particularly if there's too much medication um, or uh, if there's substance use from alcohol uh, or illicit substances. Um, there are specific medications, obviously, that uh, put folks at risk for delirium, and particularly in the older population, um, the, sed the sedating medications um, tend to cause a delirious state. 
there are three different types of delirium. Um, first, there's a hypoactive, uh, which is characterized by really lethargy, um, you know, sedation, just not being able to arouse in, in a typical fashion. The hyperactive subtype is more restless, has more physical agitation. Um, and then you can also have a mixed delirium where you see features of both the hypoactive and the hyperactive. Often the symptoms of delirium fluctuate throughout the day. And um, typically they're worse at night, but not, not always. But there, there definitely is a fluctuating course. And that is, again, one of the hallmarks of delirium. The prognosis of delirium is not good if it's not treated. Um, there is a higher rate of mortality for patients um, that are controlled for age, medical condition, um, all the variables. If you control two cohorts, uh, the group with delirium will have a higher mortality rate. Um, there is also a higher rate of institutionalization because delirium alters the mental state in a way that patients often can't take care of themselves the way they, they did prior to um, getting sick. Um, and oftentimes, they're not able to go home after a, uh, after a discharge from the hospital, and they'll need to go to a different uh, facility to, to transition. There's also a phenomenon called persistent delirium. And that relates to um, delirium symptoms that persist beyond the discharge from a hospital. And um, the persistent delirium rates vary, but typically by three months, 50% of patients um, have resolution of their delirium. But there are studies that show even after that, even you know, after six months, there still can be some lingering symptoms. And so this, um, this suggests that really early diagnosis, early intervention um, can lead to a better outcome. So how do we treat delirium? So you have um, a family member who all of a sudden has a change in their mental status. It's acute. Um, there's a, fluctu a fluctuating course, meaning some hours of the day they're better, some hours of the day they're not. Um, what you really want to do is treat the underlying medical cause. And so basically, if there's an infection, you want to treat that infection. If there's dehydration, you want to replenish their fluids. Um, frequent orientation or frequent reorientation also really helps um, in the treatment of delirium. That refers to reminding people kind of where they are, what time of day it is, um, the setting that they're in, um, kind of you know what month and what year, to just uh, cue them in to their surroundings and, and to lessen that confusion. Um, you'd like to avoid sedating medication because that can actually compound the and worsen the delirium. Um, so there are specific classes of medication you'd want to avoid, and generally those are the benzodiazepines, also antihistamines you'd, like, you'd want to avoid. Um, and there's, there's, other, um, there's other ones that don't belong in actually specific classes. And also you want to provide sensory adaptations. And so that means if someone usually wears glasses, that they should have, they should have their glasses, um, so that lessens their confusion. If they have any hearing impairment, um, that they have hearing aids, again, so that um, a sensory loss or impairment uh, does not worsen the confusion um, and can just tune them into kind of who they are, where they are. And it helps to um, shorten the length of the delirium and also uh, decrease the intensity. So next we'll talk about dementia. Dementia is a syndrome, um, and it's characterized by, number one, a short-term memory impairment. I believe there have been many webinars about dementia, 
So we'll just highlight um, some of the features of dementia today, um, but I think you can really find more details in other webinars in the series. Um, in addition to short-term memory impairment, there must be one additional impairment in one of the other ways that the brain thinks. So that can be in language, in motor, in sensory memory, as well as executive functioning. That means their ability to think of uh, plans and then execute them. These symptoms have to cause an impairment in the way uh, there's people function in a social manner or an occupational manner. And um, one of the key features is that it's a progressive course. So unlike delirium, which we just talked about, where there's a fluctuating course, um, dementia is a progressive course. On top of the cognitive symptoms of dementia, um, there are also neuropsychiatric symptoms that aren't present in everyone with dementia, but is actually quite common. Um, probably in at least half of the patients um, that have dementia will experience neuropsychiatric symptoms at some point of their illness. Um, these symptoms are often the most taxing to caregivers, um, and they often cause the most distress for the patient themselves, as well as uh, the, the people that take care of them. So neuropsychiatric symptoms can involve <clears throat> mood, uh, agitation, apathy, and psychosis. So with mood, um, the most frequent um, finding with dementia is depression. With agitation, it can be um, a restlessness, an irritability. Uh, there can be wandering with agitation. Um, and so those, those symptoms, like I said, are often very uh, distressing to the patient and the family. There often also is apathy, so that's kind of just a sense of low motivation, a low interest in engaging uh, in activities. And also there can be psychosis. So in, when I say psychosis, I'm referring to um, false beliefs, which, might, which we term delusions, um, or perceptual beliefs visual, auditory, believing that they see things or hear things that other people don't see or hear. Um, the false beliefs, the delusions, um, often take a form of um, a paranoid um, feature um, or also misidentification. So believing that family members are actually other people, um, worrying that things are getting stolen from them. Um, those are kind of the predominant themes of the psychosis and dementia. There are, are several causes for dementia, but really for the predominant one is Alzheimer's. And um, you can see that's over 60% of the subtypes are really attributed to Alzheimer's. And, um, I, I won't go through the specific ideology for, for each cause, but just to say that beyond Alzheimer's, there's also mixed causes. There are other dementias, including Lewy body, vascular, and other subtypes, including Huntington's. Uh, there can be dementia from HIV, dementia from alcohol. Um, and so oftentimes, I think we refer to dementia uh, as equivalent to Alzheimer's, but in fact, there, there are many others. Um, and frontal temporal dementia is also a very uh, one of the um, one of the more common ones um, that probably should be uh, shown on this pie graph. So this these numbers are taken from the Alzheimer's Association, and you can see that the epidemiology um, really reflects um, trends in aging. And so when folks are 65 and older, there's a prevalence of about 10% of dementia. But really as people age, so uh, over 75 and notably over 85 years old, um, almost half of the population can have a diagnosis of dementia. Um, of these, so right now about um, 5 million people in the United States are affected with Alzheimer's disease and um, 
you know, actually 40%, almost 40% of these people are undiagnosed. And so, you know, this is part of the work we're doing today is to bring light um, to the issues and um, help, help educate. So the number one risk factor of dementia is age, and as we saw from the previous slide, really the, the older one ages, the higher the prevalence of dementia that exists in the population. Other uh, less contributory uh, risk factors can be uh, family history, smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, depression, particularly untreated depression, and alcohol. So uh, obviously age and family history is not something that we can control, but there are certainly a number of risk factors that um, can be modified. Um, and I think that's a lot of the, where the, a lot of the attention now in terms of being, having a healthy lifestyle, trying to get people to exercise their, their brain, their body. Um, all of these goals are to help attenuate these risk factors that we can control. Unfortunately, there is no specific diagnostic test for dementia. It's really a clinical diagnosis that is made. Um, and that's taken together from the history that the patient reports, that the family reports, um, doing a physical exam, doing some cognitive testing that's often, that's really just office-based, um, and uh, also getting a, an assessment of one's functional ability basically how much, how much help they need to carry on their day-to-day -day tasks. If, if, one per, if a person is able to do these things independently or they actually need help from other people. Um, also, in terms of making that diagnosis, there can be lab work that is ordered um, to check for some things that might be able to be corrected um, that could affect memory, um, as well as head imaging. So it's really a clinical diagnosis, putting together all the pieces of the puzzle, um, uh, and that, that can be made with your doctor. In terms of the treatment for dementia, um, you know, we're still missing uh, the magic pill um, to really treat dementia. So of the treatments that we have right now, the goal is really to preserve one's functional status, to keep people as functionally independent as, as they can be to really try to slow the progression of the disease. And the way we do that is to provide support, um, to pro provide support to the patient, to provide support to their caregivers. Um, another big piece of the treatment is education, so that people know um, what are the symptoms, what should they expect, you know, when, when is the time to ask for more help, when is the time to um, make a change to something. Um, we really want to focus on non-drug management first. Um, that would mean making some changes to behaviors, making some changes to the environment. Um, but there are really a lot of ma uh, non-drug management strategies that should be tailored to the individual to, uh, treat, to help treat the dementia. And as a last, last resort, there are some medications available um, to, again, help preserve the functional status. Unfortunately, the medication is not at a curative standpoint at this, uh, at this time, but hopefully in the years to come. Um, so the last of the triad I'd like to talk about today is depression. Depression is a mood disorder, and it's characterized by um, either a pervasive low mood or a loss of interest in activities. And um, on top of that, there are also uh, difficulties with sleep, appetite, energy, concentration, worthlessness or guilt, motor slowing, um, or the presence of suicidal ideation. These symptoms have to be present for over two weeks. And they have to be um, intense enough that they really affect one's social or occupational functioning. We all have sad days, um, and so what I'm talking about here is really a clinical depression, and um, you know, I think there are various ways that depression is defined, but we're really talking about a clinical depression, and so it really has to meet these uh, characteristics, and again, last over two weeks long at least. 
Specifically in older adults, I just wanted to point out some tidbits that depression is not a normal part of aging. That's really, um, that, that's really a myth that we need to dispel, that just because folks get older, it's not natural that they're, that they're sad all the time but they're, or that they're grieving all the time. Um, so it is not a normal part of aging. In older adults, they also typically tend to deny sadness. They'll deny depression, but instead, um, they'll complain of a lot of physical problems. Um, achiness, uh, stomach upset, um, you know, joint pain. There, there can be a lot of variations. Um, but oftentimes, if you just go up, out and ask, are you depressed, they will deny it. But in fact, um, they can be in an episode of depression and, and they will endorse the physical complaints more um, than the, their emotional state. Uh, depression in adults, older adults, is really highlighted because they actually have the highest rate of suicide. So we're finding that older, single, white men have the highest rate of suicide. And so this is a deadly disease. And um, so it's important that we talk about it. Uh, depression can also worsen other illnesses. So if untreated and someone has exists coexisting cardiac disease, um, their depression can worsen their heart condition. Um, and there are, there are other variations of that. So the heart, the heart disease is just one uh, example. And depression can also present as uh, what we call a pseudo-dementia. So it's not a true dementia, it's a pseudo-dementia, meaning the poor concentration, the poor focus, the irritability that people can have with depression can look like they have a cognitive disorder like dementia. Um, but you'll find that when you actually treat the depression, that those cognitive symptoms um, go away. And so it can cause, like I said, a pseudo-dementia, um, and it can kind of confound uh, what we're looking at. The prevalence of depression is very high. It's the second leading cause of disability worldwide. And so it causes people to um, not be able to function at their at their jobs, it causes disruption in their families, it causes disruption in, in the ability that people can take care of themselves. Um, it affects 15 out of every 100 adults age 65 and older. Um, and of those, only 10% receive treatment. Um, and if untreated, the depression can last months to years. So. The prevalence is high, and we really want to bring our attention um, to the possibility of depression um, if you see someone with uh, the mood symptoms as characterized um, before. The good news is that depression is very treatable. Over 80% of cases are treatable. And um, that can be through your primary care physician. It can be through a mental health specialist. Um, and there are multiple modalities. And um, I've listed a few of those. So one can be psychotherapy, kind of uh, talking on a regular basis, objectively, typically for about an hour at a time. Um, another can be with medication. And specifically in older adults with depression, um, ECT is probably the most um, effective treatment that we have to date. Um, and there are other modalities beyond this. And so there is treatment for depression. And um, if I think you know, the, the, the rate limiting factor is actually getting the diagnosis, getting people to, to start talking about, about their mood states. So we've gone over delirium, depression, and depression independently. Um, and hopefully you've been able to appreciate some of the nuances that there are some overlapping symptoms between uh, each of the three diagnoses. Just to review, there are common features that you can see in, in all three. 
Um, the first is confusion. Second, there can be irritability. Third, there can be disrupted sleep. And in all three diagnoses, there can be the presence of hallucinations or delusions. What really differentiates uh, the three diagnoses is the time course, um, kind of how soon it starts and how long it lasts. Um, also, the causes for each of the diagnoses is really, really different. And therefore, the interventions, you know, how you really get people feeling better back to themselves can be um, very different too. Um, and so just looking at the common features alone, um, there may be ambiguity in terms of what diagnosis is going on. Um, but that's, that's when you would want to talk to your doctor to see a specialist um, to really see what's the, what's the best approach. Um, and here is just a chart um, spelling out some of these differences, specifically between delirium and, and dementia. Um, and specifically, I just want to point out the top few, that the onset for delirium is acute, whereas dementia, it's really, it's gradual and oftentimes subtle. The course for delirium is fluctuating. Some hours good, some hours bad. Some days good, some days bad. Dementia really is a progressive course. Um, and, over, and the duration is also markedly different. So whereas delirium lasts for hours to months, dementia can re is really a chronic illness that lasts for years. So to summarize our presentation today, um, delirium, dementia, and depression are really three distinct syndromes that are very commonly seen in older adults. Um, and specifically in my field of geriatric psychiatry, this really is um, what I'm asked to consult on most of the time. The tricky part is, is that the, all three can exist simultaneously in the same person, um, and that one increases the risk for the other syndrome. So therefore, diagnosis, really early diagnosis, is the key to treatment and to help shape the optimal outcome. Thank you. And just a reminder that you can um, ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. So I've got a few questions already that have come in. The first one is, I always heard that exercising your brain keeps the neurons connecting and defers dementia. Is there actual evidence that mental stimulation defers dementia? Um, it's a great question, and I think a lot of the research is actually being uh, focused on this specific question. Um, there is existing evidence that exercise, exercise can help, um, help some of the symptoms uh, of dementia. It doesn't actually, um, it's, it's not going to prevent in a curative sense. Um, but it can, it can delay the onset of dementia. And so, you know, if there's any preventative way that we can delay dementia for, you know, even several months to several years, and that's really with um, exercising your mind and your body, there's really probably a combination and a synergistic effect of the two, um, that there can be cases where dementia is actually deferred. Um, but it's not completely prevented. But stay tuned. Um, like I said, there's really a lot of hot research on that topic. And some of that use research is actually being done at UCLA with the Longevity Center. Um, what is sundowning in dementia? So sundowning in dementia is a phenomenon that refers to um, a worsening of the cognitive symptoms, so that's some of the confusion, the disorientation, um, that occurs with sundowning. So typically that happens in the late afternoon, early evening, um, and we really don't know the exact cause of why symptoms get worse around that time of day. Um, there's probably a circadian effect with, um, you know, internally in your brain 
kind of telling you um, the sun is down. Um, and without that light stimulation, that that's when kind of confusion sets on about, you know, is it day, is it night? It's kind of a very rudimentary explanation. Um, so sundowning is the phenomenon of the syndrome, the, the symptoms worsening um, at a specific time in the late day. Um, and um, if you see that as a pattern in uh, someone that you know that has dementia, there are ways, like I said, some non-drug management ways, and there can be also drugs to help kind of, um, kind of try to prevent the send downing or try to minimize some of those symptoms. Um, another question is, uh, can diet protect me from dementia? Um, so obviously this is also another hot topic right now in dementia that kind of piggybacks the, um, the general question of, you know, are there lifestyle modifications that we can um, participate in to really try to offset dementia? And um, certainly the, there is strong evidence that people with very specific diets, particularly Mediterranean diets, have longevity. Um, in certain populations. Um, and so m there, there is good evidence that Mediterranean diet is absolutely good for the brain. Um, there are other um, kind of diet fads that have really mixed evidence um, in terms of if they can help someone with their memory. Um, but these really haven't been proven over and over again. So those re there's really kind of mixed evidence between with, with other um, diet interventions. But the, I think the general recommendation would be a diet that's, again, healthy for your heart will be healthy for your brain. Um, another question that's come in, how can delirium be prevented in older adults? So um, unfortunately, we're unable to prevent delirium completely. Um, but really, early diagnosis, early treatment can really shorten the intensity and the duration of delirium. If older adults have already a pre-existing dementia, um, then I think some of the re reorientation uh, methods that we talked about can really uh, help minimize the delirium when folks have to transition between different settings. Um, oftentimes, changes in environment can really worsen uh, confusion. Um, and so, you know, little things like bringing photographs of um, people that they're accustomed to being around. Um, bringing you know, one's own blanket, one's own belongings into the hospital. Um, so again, so that, so, so that people with dementia, if they have to go to the hospital, um, have less confusion with the change in environment. Um, but in terms of complete prevention, you know, there's really no way to do that. You know, obviously, if there's a medical cause causing the delirium, um, we really want to find the medical cause and to treat it. Um, and that's really kind of the best safeguard that we have in terms of shortening the course of delirium. Um, I'm going to see if there's any more questions. So that's it for today. Um, thank you for joining us.